Day 21 of Trump's hush money trial. Shortly before heading into the courtroom for closing arguments, former President Trump stood before a cluster of microphones, repeating his claims that he was forced to attend the hush money trial because of President Joe Biden. Without providing evidence, he decried the proceedings as election hunting and election interfering, suggesting it was an effort to undermine his political ambitions. Trump accused Judge Merchant of being highly conflicted and corrupt, reading aloud quotes from legal analysts who supported his assertions that he had committed no wrongdoing. He lamented the judge's gag order, which barred him from making disparaging comments against those involved in the case, calling it an unconstitutional restriction on a presidential candidate. This is not a trial that should happen. It's a very sad day. This is a dark day in America, Trump declared. We have a rigged court case that should have never been brought, and it should have been brought in another jurisdiction. As the scene shifted to the courtroom, Judge Merchant addressed the jury, providing an overview of the summations they were about to hear. He reminded them that the lawyer's arguments were not evidence, and that they, the jury, were the sole judges of the facts in the case. At around 9.40 a.m., Trump's lawyer, Todd Blanche, began his closing arguments. He reiterated to the jury that President Trump was innocent, emphasizing that the district attorney had failed to meet the burden of proof. Blanche argued that the case hinged not on testimonies, but on documents. Displaying a chart of financial records, Blanche asserted that the invoices and bookings were accurate, with no intent to defraud. He concluded by urging the jury to scrutinize the evidence carefully, suggesting that if they believed the documents were true, they need not look further. With the defense's closing arguments underway, the tension in the courtroom was palpable. All eyes were now on the jury, the finders of fact, as they prepared to deliberate on a case that had captivated the nation. Blanche is doing two things simultaneously to plant seeds of reasonable doubt early in this closing argument. Establish that the internal records at the heart of this case weren't falsified, and that Michael Cohen is a liar. Blanche appeared to suggest that Cohen received retainer payments not because of the hush money arrangement, but because he was Trump's personal attorney. There's a reason why in life usually the simplest answer is the right one, and that's certainly the case here. That the story Mr. Cohen told you on that witness stand is not true. Cohen was paid $35,000 a month by Trump to be his attorney, Blanche said. Blanche is working hard to try to preempt certain arguments the jury is likely to hear from the prosecution after he sits down. Because he goes first and the prosecution will have the last word, per New York law, he can't afford not to address the toughest evidence for his client. Blanche commented on the fact that Retainer was listed as the reason for the reimbursement checks from Trump to Cohen. There's nothing sinister or criminal about that word, Blanche said. Blanche said it wasn't put there by Trump or Alan Weisselberg, but by Trump Organization accounting employee Deb Tarasoff, who testified earlier in the trial. Blanche told jurors it was a stretch that Trump always had full knowledge of what was happening inside the Trump Organization and his other business enterprises. That is reasonable doubt, ladies and gentlemen, he said. Blanche repeatedly refers to Trump being in the White House when the repayments were made. He was very busy, Blanche said. That he was somehow in on a scheme to conceal a repayment is absurd, he added. His argument also reminds the jury this is no normal defendant. It's the former president of the United States. It's an interesting line to walk. Trump is so careful about his finances that he would never overpay, but he was also so busy in the White House that he was sometimes careless and wouldn't know what he was paying for. Blanche asked the jurors whether they believed for a second that, after getting stiffed on his bonus in 2016, when he thought he worked so hard, Cohen would then want to work for free for Trump. Was that the man who testified, Blanche asked rhetorically, or was that a lie? Cohen did indeed testify that he was upset after he did not receive a holiday season bonus after the 2016 presidential election, but he repeatedly rejected the defense team's suggestions that bitterness and vindictiveness drove him to cooperate with prosecutors. Blanche then argued it was absurd that Trump would agree to pay Cohen $420,000, even though the former president owed him only $130,000. Blanche, attempting to undercut one of the key planks of the prosecution's narrative, told the jury that it's absurd to believe that positive stories in the National Enquirer could affect the outcome of an American election. 
The idea that even sophisticated people like President Trump and David Pecker believed that positive stories in the National Enquirer could influence the 2016 election is preposterous, Blanche said, referring to the former publisher of the tabloid magazine. He went on to say that many of the articles published in the Enquirer were recycled from other outlets. Pecker testified earlier in the trial that he purchased potentially damaging stories about Trump and then made sure they never saw the light of day, a practice known as catch and kill. He also testified that his editorial team attempted to run more glowing stories about Trump in the lead up to the 2016 election. Blanche argued that the effort to silence Karen McDougal is not a catch and kill either because she didn't want her story published. Blanche said McDougal wanted to kickstart her career be on the cover of magazines and write articles. He said it wasn't McDougal's intention to publish her story. She didn't want her story published, he said. Blanche wants the jury to believe that Michael Cohen's recording of the call with Trump is unreliable because it cuts off early. But more than that, Blanche is trying to tell the jury that the transcript of what they have is unreliable because while the recording discussed AMI and Pecker, there is doubt that they are talking about Karen McDougal, whose name is never mentioned, or any payment of $150,000, which cannot be heard on the tape. Blanche says they were talking past each other and that Cohen's invocation of financing shocked Trump, who had no idea what was going on, and that Cohen's interpretation of cash to mean actual bills is a fiction designed to make the conversation sound more sinister. Blanche just said of Daniel's non-disclosure agreement, this started out as an extortion, and it ended up very well for Miss Daniels, there's no doubt about that. The prosecution has not objected to Blanche's repeated use of the word extortion, which suggests a crime was committed. That could be a strategic choice, because what they say in refuting that characterization during their own summation could be more memorable and powerful than a sustained objection. Blanche may be the first person to portray Trump as the victim of the Access Hollywood tape, though Blanche says it was not so catastrophic as to motivate Trump to break the law, more precisely, that there's no evidence that it was. He says this of the release of the video October 7, 2016. This was an extremely personal event for President Trump. Nobody wants their family to be subjected to that sort of thing. Blanche began shouting as he again accused Cohen of lying under oath. He reminded jurors that Cohen testified that he called Trump on October 24, 2016, to provide an update on the Daniels situation. It was a lie, he said, pointing out that the call was actually to Trump's bodyguard, Keith Schiller. That was a lie and he got caught red-handed, Blanche added. Blanche said that Michael Cohen has lied to his family, including his wife and kids, his banker, the Federal Election Commission, reporters, Congress, prosecutors, business associates, and bosses. He's literally like the MVP of liars, Blanche said. Blanche says that Michael Cohen is the greatest liar of all time. Michael Cohen is the gloat. He's literally the greatest liar of all time, Blanche said, a play on the sports term goat greatest of all time. He has lied to every single branch of Congress. He added, he has lied to the Department of Justice. Blanche is insisting that there can be no felony falsification of business records because even if there was a conspiracy to influence the election, it was not carried out through any unlawful means. To support his no unlawful means argument, Blanche said there is no proof Trump ever knew, for example, about certain paperwork Michael Cohen submitted to his bank or paperwork prepared to transfer Karen McDougal's life rights from AMI to Trump. Trump's knowledge, however, is not required. All that matters legally is that a member of the conspiracy undertook those unlawful means. Blanche finished his summation at 12.49 p.m., about three hours after he began the closing arguments. The prosecution is now kicking off its closing arguments. Joshua Steinglass will give them. The defense seems to be questioning our integrity, Steinglass told the jury near the top of his summation. But, he argued, it was the defense that didn't properly depict phone records. The call summaries were made to help guide you, the prosecutor explained to the jury. The phone records are all in evidence and you can look through them at your leisure, he added. It's also an interesting accusation, Steinglass points out given that the defense's summary of calls between Cohen and Costello double counts their calls. He also reminds them that not every phone call is accounted for in their phone records. Cohen had 11 phone numbers for Trump. They had records corresponding to two of them. Steinglass defended the state's witnesses against the Trump team's accusations of lying, 
but he added that the jury does not necessarily need to believe every word of Cohen's testimony to find that there was a conspiracy to unlawfully influence the 2016 election. You don't need Michael Cohen to prove that one bit, Steinglass said, referring to the state's accusation of a conspiracy. He added that Hope Hicks, Rona Graff, Madeleine Westerhout, Jeffrey McConney, and Deborah Tarasoff were all witnesses who liked Trump but confirmed Cohen's testimony. Steinglass displayed quotes from one of the state's exhibits, a phone call in which Cohen, well before he started cooperating with prosecutors, tells Davidson that Trump hates the fact that his team settled with Daniels. The quotes undercut the defense team's insistence that Trump knew nothing about the hush money payments to Daniels. Steinglass is laying out how the defense has gone to great lengths to shame Stormy Daniels, saying that she changed her story, but adds that her false denials have been thoroughly discussed and explained. She lived 2017 in pure silence, Michael Cohen came out and said sex never happened, and Daniels felt compelled to set the record straight, he said. Steinglass said that parts of her testimony were cringeworthy and uncomfortable, but details like what the suite at Harrah's looked like and how the toiletry bag appeared ring true. They're the kind of details you'd expect someone to remember, Steinglass explained, adding that, fortunately she was not asked or did she volunteer specific details of the sexual act itself. It certainly is true you don't have to prove that sex took place. That is not an element of the crime, the defendant knew what happened and reinforces the incentive to buy her silence," explained Steinglass. Her story is messy, he said, but that's kind of the point. That's the display the defendant didn't want the American voter to see. If her testimony were so irrelevant, why did they work so hard to discredit her, he added. In the simplest terms, Stormy Daniels is the motive. Steinglass is trying to reason with the jury, telling the jurors that they don't need to feel bad for Cohen but they should understand where Cohen is coming from. I am not asking you to feel bad for Michael Cohen, he made his bed, Steinglass said. But you can hardly blame him that he's making money for the one thing he has left, he added, referencing Cohen's knowledge of the inner workings of the Trump organization. Steinglass zeroed in on an example of what the prosecution considers an inconsistency in the defense team's case. He told the jury that if the $420,000 payment for Cohen was for legal services, as the defense argued, Cohen could not have stolen $60,000 from the Trump Organization, as the defense also argued. It's either one or the other, the prosecutor argues, not both. As the prosecution delivered its final rebuttal, the weight of the case began to visibly affect the jury. The jurors, a diverse group of men and women from various walks of life, now faced the monumental task of parsing through the emotional and factual labyrinth laid before them. Steinglass is forcefully pushing back on the Trump team's attempts to tarnish Cohen's character and motives, reminding the jury that the ex-fixer was once a valued member of the former president's inner circle. We didn't choose Michael Cohen. We didn't pick him up at the witness store. Mr. Trump chose Mr. Cohen for the same qualities his attorneys now urge you to reject. Cohen's top quality was loyalty to his former boss, Steinglass said. Cohen was drawn to the defendant like a moth to a flame and he wasn't the only one. David Pecker saw Mr. Trump as a mentor. Mr. Trump saw David Pecker as a useful tool. The jurors exchanged glances, the room thick with the gravity of the moment. Each of them was a vessel for the collective conscience of the nation, and they felt it deeply. Steinglass is now using an imaginary conversation to explain Cohen's retelling of some of the stories or dates he'd recounted to the jury that Trump's lawyers had questioned. These guys know each other well, they speak in code. A better explanation is that Cohen could have gotten the time and place of the call wrong. This is one date in many, he spoke to the defendant 20 times in the month of October, Steinglass said. Let's say you had dinner at a restaurant with an old friend, and the friend says they were getting married. Later you find a receipt and think that was the night they told you they were getting married, but found out the friend was actually in California on that night. That does not mean that you are lying about the fact that you had dinner with the friend or about the fact that your friend told you they were getting married," Steinglass said. The jury, with furrowed brows and pensive expressions, seemed to absorb the analogy, understanding the nuanced argument being laid out before them. Steinglass is fighting back against the defense's rhetoric that the only evidence in this case came from Michael Cohen's testimony, 
The prosecutor told the jury that Judge Merchant will say Cohen is an accomplice because he participated in these crimes, but you cannot convict Trump on Cohen's word alone unless there is corroborating evidence. Steinglass said that there is a mountain of evidence in the case, saying, it's difficult to conceive of a case with more corroboration than this one. The jurors nodded subtly, taking in the enormity of the evidence presented, knowing that their verdict would not only affect the lives of those involved but also set a precedent for future generations. Prosecutor Joshua Steinglass discussed a call between David Pecker and Trump in which Pecker apprised him that Michael Cohen had told Trump about Karen McDougal coming forward. This call makes it impossible for the defense to claim that Cohen was acting on his own here, Steinglass said. He said the transaction was an unlawful corporate contribution to the Trump campaign, and not only did Trump know about it, Steinglass said, but he participated as well. Prosecutor Joshua Steinglass tried to turn one of defense attorney Todd Blanche's better arguments on its head. Steinglass said that Trump didn't sign the agreement because that was the point. The agreement was no less enforceable without his signature. The timing of the payment on October 27, 2016, Steinglass argued, further showed that Trump's primary concern was not his family, but the election. Prosecutor Joshua Steinglass told the jury in closing arguments that, these documents are so damning that you almost have to laugh at an argument presented by Trump's defense. Steinglass was referring to a comments by defense attorney Todd Blanche that the records were not false because if they were false, they would have been destroyed. Steinglass also argued that the Form 1099-S on which Trump reported payments to Michael Cohen of $105,000 and $315,000 were another unlawful means through which the conspiracy was acted upon. As the prosecution wrapped up its closing arguments, the jury's journey was far from over. They would soon retreat into the deliberation room, carrying with them the weight of a nation's expectations and the echoes of a courtroom battle that had captivated the world. The emotional and intellectual burden they bore was immense, and the path to a verdict would be long and fraught with challenges. Given the largely chronological order of the prosecution's closing arguments, Prosecutor Joshua Steinglass could be nearing the end of his remarks. He discussed what he called Hope Hicks's devastating testimony earlier in the trial, adding that she burst into tears because she realized the impact of what she had told the court. Defense attorney Todd Blanche objected to that characterization, but Judge Juan Merchant allowed it. Prosecutor Joshua Steinglass mocked former Trump aide Madeleine Westerhout's testimony in which she said Trump was often so busy that sometimes he absent-mindedly signed presidential proclamations. Steinglass, who dismissed Westerhout's remarks as a narrative Trump's team encouraged, said that overall she gave the opposite impression, that the former president remained very attentive to outlays of his personal expenses, and that his most frequent contacts included his former attorney Michael Cohen and a former top executive of his company, Alan Weisselberg. Westerhout's testimony also conveyed that Trump continued to be the sole signatory on his own accounts, even though he easily could have added other signatories, Steinglass argued. Trump wanted to maintain control, and he insists on signing his own checks, Steinglass said, adding that Trump boasted about his frugality and micromanagement in his books, which Steinglass read excerpts from. Steinglass also rejected the defense's argument that Trump was too busy to be involved in certain financial transactions. He's in charge of a company for 40 years. The defendant's entire business philosophy was to be involved in everything. Steinglass said. Given the hour, it was initially unclear why prosecutor Joshua Steinglass began revisiting the testimony of Robert Costello, a Trump ally and lawyer who has clashed with Michael Cohen. But the prosecution's display of an email exchange between Costello and Cohen hinted that the DA's office aims to portray Trump's attitude toward Cohen, changing only after his former attorney's compliance was in doubt, not because of anything else Cohen did. Recounting Costello's testimony, Steinglass argued that Costello's assertion that he was acting in Cohen's best interest and that he didn't care at all about the defendant's interest was a bold-faced lie. Prosecutor Joshua Steinglass began accelerating and emphasizing his delivery to jurors during closing arguments with minutes to go before an 8 p.m. deadline. Steinglass reiterated to the jurors that it is a crime to willfully create inaccurate tax forms and that Trump's intent to defraud in this case is clear. He argued that why else would Stormy Daniels be paid in what he described as an elaborate scheme instead of all at once?
Steinglass argued that that and other steps show Trump wanted the issue to be kept quiet until after the election. The name of the game was concealment, Steinglass said. Closing arguments are done at 8 p.m. after an 11-hour day for the jury. Court will resume at 10 a.m. tomorrow. With the closing arguments now behind them, the jurors retreated for the night, the weight of their decision pressing heavily upon them. As they left the courtroom, the world outside buzzed with anticipation, every news outlet and social media platform alive with speculation and debate. The gravity of their task was monumental, and the jurors knew that their verdict would resonate far beyond the confines of the courtroom. As the clock struck 8 p.m., the courtroom emptied, leaving behind an echo of the day's intense deliberations. Prosecutor Joshua Steinglass had delivered his final words with a sense of urgency and conviction, painting a vivid picture of deceit and meticulous concealment. The defense had fought back valiantly, but the prosecution's narrative had woven a compelling tapestry of evidence and testimony. The jurors, now dispersed, carried with them the echoes of Steinglass's closing remarks, the emotional testimonies, and the intricate web of facts and arguments that had been laid before them. Each juror in their solitude would reflect on the day's proceedings, grappling with the enormity of the decision they would soon have to make. As the night wore on, the city outside the courthouse seemed to hold its breath, waiting for the dawn and the resumption of court at 10 a.m. tomorrow. The world would once again turn its eyes to this courtroom, eager for a resolution, a verdict that would echo through history. Stay tuned for the next chapter in this gripping saga. Subscribe to our channel to stay updated with the latest developments and the final verdict. The journey is far from over, and the truth awaits.